I am not President Davenport. Um, in fact, when he called me this morning, he said, Steve, I have never missed in 17 years a Douglas Armour lecture, he said. But he had been sick for two and a half days, and uh, he sends his regrets. But if you're watching President Davenport, we are live streaming this. We sent you the link, and uh, we uh, welcome you as well as the audience. So um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Steve Stoinoff. Um, I am a professor of English, and I also have the privilege of serving currently as the interim associate vice president for research and the Dean of Graduate Education. So it is a privilege in that role to be able to serve with so many faculty that are engaged in the kind of scholarship and research and creative activity that defines our institution and has elevated its impact, not only in our region, but nationally. And we have a long line of previous faculty members who have stood before an audience like this um, and, and delivered the Douglas R. Moore uh, lectureship. Um, and I want to uh, thank the selection committee for the work of vetting those applicants for this distinguished award, the most elevated um, faculty research award that the university confers on an individual. And um, we had a record number of applications this year. And I want to publicly acknowledge the chair of the selection committee, Dr. Gwen Westerman. And if there are any members of the selection committee that are with us this evening, if you just stand also. Thank you. Unlike much of the committee work on campus, the selection committee for the Douglas R. Moore Award is a committee comprised of only past recipients. So you have to have received the award to be uh, impaneled and given the, the uh, consideration of selecting the, the next recipient. So their work has led to the designation um, of this year's 2020 uh, recipient, which I will hold you in suspense until after the current year's recipient delivers his, uh, his presentation. So the Douglas R. Moore Faculty Research Lectureship honors faculty who are engaged in an activity that demonstrates a quality of excellence in discovery and provides a venue for sharing that knowledge in a manner that enriches the intellectual life of the university community. Tonight, I'm pleased to introduce the recipient of the 2019 Faculty Research Award, Professor Brian Frank. Brian is a professor and chair of the Department of Art, and um, it's, a, it's a special privilege for me because I've known Brian for as long as I've been here on faculty, and that was, uh, goes back as far as the turn of the last century, I think. So, um, but he's always been someone whose work I've admired. Um, he's, he's an unassuming um, individual that, that just wants to share his passion for art. And so I've always found it um, really, really a pleasure to, to have the opportunity to, to see the kinds of creative energies that he's able to bring to a canvas. Um, your paintings, Brian, synthesize traditional landscape imagery, and sources combined with otherworldly quality. I'm looking forward to learning more about how you utilize patterns, colors, and forms to represent and elicit the mystery and the wonderment of the natural world. So um, please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Frink, and I'm going to give him his award on behalf of the president tonight, and then we'll let him begin his lecture. Thank you very much. So, appreciate it. So can I go now? <laughs> oh, it's such a pleasure to be here. It truly is. And it's so great to see uh, so many friends and family, uh, former students and former colleagues and current colleagues and administrators and just the whole uh, community that I'm uh, delighted to be part of here uh, to hear me talk a little bit about my work. Um, first off, though, I'd like to send love and care to Ginger. Um, that's all I'll say. So um, let's get on with the show. 
Mo, could you turn down the lights a bit? Maybe not? <laughs> well, we'll go with these, I guess. I hope everybody can see the screen okay. Um, again, I'd like to welcome everybody. I'd like to recognize a few people. First, um, my mother and father, Joe and Darlene, right down here in the front. They, they came from, you don't have to stand up, it's okay. Thank you, that's great. That's good. Uh, they came all the way from Illinois for this, and I'm really happy we didn't have some kind of crazy blizzard or a snow, snow apocalypse or something like that. I'd also like to recognize my partner, Wilbur. She's right here in the front. Wilbur, you just want to frame. Uh, my, our daughter, Anna Keiko, right there, her husband, Jason, and our three grandkids, Wyatt, Grant, and Charlotte. Our son, Blake, and his partner, Deanna, couldn't be here. He's doing the Lord's work, teaching sixth graders up in Fargo. So uh, he has to work tomorrow, uh, but um, he's in my thoughts. Uh, all of our children, um, not the grandkids yet, but uh, Wilbur has received her, her uh, master's here. Jason has his undergrad and his master's. Anna has her undergrad. And halfway to her master's, Blake got his undergrad here and his spouse got her undergrad. And so I have a lot of gratitude towards this institution for what they've provided my family as well as myself in terms of my research. So I'm very grateful. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to recognize the Minnesota State Arts Board for their support. While they didn't directly support this specific project, uh, they did support much of the work that has led up to what I've done here. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge, and I think this is important because I'm dealing with the land, I'm dealing with the landscape um, of this region. I would like to acknowledge the land we call home, that we call ours, is also Dakota homeland. Now on with the show. Tonight I'll be discussing uh, a very brief um, bit of the history of landscape painting. My apologies to the historians. I only have about 30 minutes to present this, and my clock is ticking. And so I'm going to just kind of glance over some of the historical aspects of, of the background on my work. I'm going to talk about modern and contemporary influences, some of my own work, and then actually making a painting. First, um, there were two basic approaches to landscape painting in America um, at the, in, the, in the 19th century. One was called luminism. Uh, and luminism was an intimate style of painting that emphasized a kind of crystalline light and a horizontal line. Uh, typically, they were of, uh, on, along the East Coast, and they faced eastward. They faced Europe. Uh, so they, the, the settlers, the, the Europeans that had come here, um, were, in a sense, uh, trying to recognize where they came from. And in a painting like this uh, by Martin Johnson Heed, you can see that it emphasizes a calmness. The water is very calm. There's a lot of poise. There's sort of a, um, a um, just kind of a, a stability about it that's important, despite the storm coming. So they, they were trying to sort of deal with the, the, the fear of the new place they were living by, you know, looking back. And the other kind of uh, American landscape painting that was occurring about this time was a uh, kind of painting that faced the other direction. It faced west. And this is an example by Thomas Cole. Uh, Cole is a famous painting called The Oxbow. And they were paintings that projected the idea of um, manifest destiny, of the idea that, that the, um, the, um, the, the, the painter and, the, and was sending the message that people were going to basically be moving in. The Europeans were going to be, this was the country that they could take over. There was no acknowledgment of people living in these spaces. Uh, they were wild and uh, they were meant to be tamed. And so in a painting like this, you can see the left side is um, uh, very kind of tortured and the right side is organized. And if you can see in there, there's even a little surveyor guy uh, like plotting things out. This is, these are important, and I'm mentioning these because I think it's, it's important to understand that uh, landscape painting um, projected, I, it's not just uh, a nice painting, a nice picture, it actually projected ideas. And this quote is from Bar Barbara Novak's book, Nature and Culture. Each view of nature then carried with it not only an aesthetic view, but a powerful self-image, a moral and social energy that could be translated into action. Many of these projections on nature augmented the American sense of his own unique nature, his unique opportunity, and could indeed foster a sense of destiny, which, when it served to rationalize questionable acts with elevated thought, could have a darker side. They were painting their future, the idea of manifest destiny, and they also felt charged by God to paint his land. My point here is that these paintings are more than just paintings. They carry social and even political charges. So that's it on the old stuff, modern influences. Charles Birchfield, was, so you can see this about another 120 or so years um, 
after the coal painting, and things had changed a lot. Uh, Europe had uh, spawned um, um, not wars, but also cubism and futurism and surrealism, and these American painters were incorporating these kind of ideas into um, an American idiom that was based on the landscape. Um, and it was a very different kind of tone, I think. So uh, some quotes from Birchfield. I feel impelled to embrace the earth. My spirit was in complete harmony with the world of nature and absorbed every sight and sound with a completeness that has not been my lot for many a month. Quoting from his journals, 1917, evening sky wonderful, dreamy, rhythmical wisps, feathery films, small flocks of blackbirds. This filmy, feathery sky seems to bring them out. Jupiter surrounded by a white glow, seen better when not looking directly at it. Where do the clouds go at night? Milky Way plain, are they made of light? A vague misty light in the air. It is pleasant to go along this country road at night. So a very different attitude, a very different idea about what the landscape was about for these artists. George O'Keefe, of course, um, was another artist that dealt with a lot with the landscape and was also informed by European movements. Um, and I'm interested in works like this where she's translating the landscape into very, um, like just this blob is a boulder and these wavy lines are a stream. So, but they're also a blob and wavy lines, so they kind of exist in both places. These works represent a different shifting relationship to the land and nature. Influenced by European artistic trends, artists began to explore a kind of art that was about a spiritual connection to the forces of nature. Many of them also visited or lived, as O'Keeffe famously did in the Southwest. They experienced the culture of the indigenous peoples that lived there. This was a fundamental shift from previous attitudes and perspectives. While there is an argument for continued cultural imperialism with O'Keeffe's and others' work, it does represent a softening of and a growing sensitivity towards a sense of spiritual animation. And that's quoting Martha Schwenninger uh, in a January 2013 review of an exhibition called The Spirit of Cultural Objects. Another artist that I'd like to bring up is George Morrison. He's a Minnesota artist. Uh, he spent many years in New York and Paris and eventually settling in Duluth. And then he purchased property near Grand Portage where he spent the rest of his life making paintings of Lake Superior. And he takes um, uh, the idea of the landscape and just kind of distills it down into a this single horizontal movement and then uses color to manipulate the space, creating a dynamic tension between the horizon line and the space around it. Uh, this is color form space. They're really incredible paintings. They're also... Um, they have a great gallery of these up in the MIA in Minneapolis. And they're, a lot of these are really kind of small and they're very suggestive of the early luminous paintings in terms of their precise surface and application of paint, but a very different kind of aesthetic and spirit. So contemporary artists I think a lot about, or think of, First, um, April Gornick. These paintings are monumental. Oh, so these are more contemporary, obviously, uh, 2015 for this painting. Uh, they're monumental, but still um, very dramatic, almost like a kind of a muted monumentality. One doesn't get the impression that the artist is talking about anything else but the power and beauty of nature. The scale and similar technique to Bierstadt, et cetera, but more internal, kind of an internalized spirituality or an internal energy. Grand, but not grand. Pat Steer is an artist who uh, sort of channels the natural forces of paint, uh, water and gravity. These are gigantic paintings, um, and they're kind of about a moment of time where she applies the paint and just lets nature take its course, gravity and the forces that, that create the movement of the paint across the canvas. Um, they're, they're about the passage of time and the residue of the mark. To quote Pat Steer, I realized I didn't have to use the brush, that I could simply pour the paint, that I could use nature to paint a picture Hello? Picture of itself by pouring the paint. That gravity would paint my painting with me. I was influenced and inspired by John Cage, his idea of non intention. Essentially, my whole voyage from that first painting of a young woman fighting her way through the paint to now is a search and an experiment. These works are important for me because of the way she uses, again, these natural forces to create the, and kind of lets the paint do its own thing, but in a very sensitive and kind of a natural way. The last artist, or another artist I'd like to point out is uh, Emily Nelligan. And I was introduced to her art when I did a residency out in Cranberry Island. And she worked exclusively with charcoal uh, going out at night to create these incredibly um, uh, beautiful uh, drawings of, of the landscape around Cranberry Island. I think they have a very mystical quality. They feel elemental, like some sort of uh, conversation in time. And they, have, they also have a kind of a cave painting quality about them. And it might be the charcoal, which is the residue of um, fire. 
There's another uh, Nelligan painting. A couple artists that live around here, Betsy Ruth Byers uh, makes paintings that refer to global climate change. This is one of her, this is a, um, a glacier that's diminishing in size that she documented. Um, I find her paintings quite incredible and, and compelling. And then Gregory Euclid is a local artist that, um, he lives actually in St. They both live in St. Peter. Um, and his work has a very direct environmental message where he uses natural materials, grasses, sticks, uh, and just bits of junk combined to, to create his paintings. So, on to the, nat the magical landscape idea. Um, I had to bring de Kooning in on this. Um, because I kind of think this is a landscape painting. It's a, it's a different kind of landscape. It was painted in 1950 um, when, after the bomb had been dropped. And so it's, it's talking about a different kind of land, a different kind of space. But he's famous for a quote that I think is important in terms of understanding how I think about how I, how I develop imagery, how I develop the content in my painting. And as I kind of move along with the talk, hopefully you'll see how that how it connects. He once referred to himself as a slipping glimpser or a painter who drew from flashes of content he encountered in daily life. In a landmark 1960 interview with critic David Sylvester, he explained this. Content, if you want to say, is a glimpse of something, an encounter, you know, like a flash. It's very tiny, very tiny content. In other words, the bits of content that inspired elements of de Kooning's canvases weren't products of premeditated planned observation, but rather a relaxed awareness of his surroundings. The artist associated the glimpse with the most ordinary kind of happening, somebody sitting on a chair or a puddle of water reflecting light. I, I think this is important for me because um, it, it, it's, it's, it's all about kind of looking at things in a very almost humble way, like making close observations of tiny things rather than just sort of looking at the grand vista, thinking more about little specific bits of, of thought and vision. The magical landscape, what is it? It's a combination of direct observation, invention, and memory. Travel has become an important catalyst. I always set up a portable studio at the campsite or in hotel rooms. A core image bank are my memories of summers in northern Wisconsin. I'm interested in a humble, more unassuming point of view, not grand vistas. Reflected flickering light is an important source of content. Trees advancing the picture plane, creating flatness, and the water expands into space. I'm far more interested in the non-grand, or again, the humble landscape. This is one of my watercolors. A lot of times I make use of on-site work and then reference photos. This is one combination. So this painting was done uh, initially laid out on site. Um, so I was observing the trees. And I also took photographs. Uh, and you can see the combination here across the top. There's the three photos. And then the kind of panoramic feel I made of the painting down below. I use photos as a reference, but only um, sparingly, I guess. I also do a lot of drawings on site where we're traveling or camping. Um, I'll just sit down and make some drawings. I would call these kind of more perceptual drawings, but I do a lot of invention in them too, whether quoting patterns or seeing sort of bits of junk on the, on the ground or something, I'll start repeating those things. Again, these are very... Um, I would call these kind of non-heroic. I'm just looking at mostly the bases of trees, and I'm sitting in the camp. I'm kind of lazy, to tell you the truth. Um, yeah, it's, it's, we go camping, and I don't go marching off somewhere. I, Wilbur and I, we just sit at the campsite. We don't go anywhere. She reads and writes, and I do this. <laughs> so I have to make it interesting. So like this drawing, uh, you can see the pattern along the bottom of the drawing um, is just something that I invented based on the sand patterns that were there. Um, I've taken, what I'm going to do now is just sort of do some photos and paintings and works that I've done uh, and just kind of go through and compare and contrast so you can kind of get a sense. And, all, and I've taken all these photos too. So um, obviously it's all my artwork, but, um, and the photos aren't exactly, they're more a way to sort of try to describe to you my creative process and where I get things. I'm not, again, using the photos as direct references ne necessarily, but just more of a document of, of what I'm looking at. Um, I'm interested, and I'm just going to kind of read some things while I flip through these. I'm interested in translating natural forces, wind, sun, light, rain, snow, etc., into patterns and painted passages. In this painting, for example, I'm using the idea of cracking ice to create a lower plane. Dripping paint is melting snow, a sense of growth, transformation, and spirit that I see in the land that surrounds me. Elemental images referencing sun, moon, rain, cave, soil, water, wave, wind, hill, or path have visual corollaries in the patterns, colors, and forms I describe within the painted space of the painting. Grids are sometimes sky or soil. 
Dots are rain, Mr. Snow. Swirling, whoops, swirling, swirling lines or smears of paint sometimes represent wind. My use of the hill or path image symbolized the journey. This work hovers between abstraction, realism, and symbolism. That's why I refer to these paintings as magical landscapes. And here's just another photo from, um, we were out on uh, Prince Edward Island, actually. And there's some, one of the paintings that's kind of from that moment. I know we're tired, super tired of looking at these things, um, but they're really quite amazing, and they always sort of blow my mind. I love looking at snow drifts, and um, I got all excited about them last winter. This winter, I um, had to actually um, have somebody take all the snow drifts off the roof of our house, which wasn't fun, so I was not pleased with them. But last winter, I got all excited and did a whole series of drawings based on snow drifts, and... I think they're magical in the way they transform the landscape. And, and these drawings, I think, kind of describe how I try to sort of translate something like in this one, the feeling of the snow um, is all these little marks, or the movement of the light across the drift on the bottom part, and the way it kind of shifts the positive and negative space is an important kind of thing for me. But then they don't look like snow drifts. It's kind of like they're snow drifts and they're not. And of course, it, this is kind of what we're seeing right now. <laughs> but even that's a source of content for me. So now we're going to make a painting. And what am I going to paint? That's the question. So to start, when I started this, when I gave my proposal uh, to the committee last year, when I talked about the project I wanted to do, part of the idea was to actually make a painting for this thing and document it very closely. So that's what I did. Um, but I didn't know what I was going to paint until last fall. So um, um, Wilbur and I went camping this past fall, and I kept thinking about what I was going to do, um, and I just started making some paintings while we were camping. And this is an example of one of my studios, and this is me just drawing. I started drawing trees. I started more trees, uh, and then I wrote on this, and I'll read what I wrote. Seeking the magic, it's in the cracks, the small places, and tiny spaces. Sticks, dirt, bits of light, finding old voice, channeling O'Keefe and C. Birch. And there you see some birch. <laughs> Suffering birch. Treatment of lights and darks is not easy thing. Need to keep works on value range. Hearing Wilbur turn pages. Waterfall in distance. Crow cawing. There's a photo of the campsite we were at. So we went camping up at um, uh, Trails End Campground at the end of Gunflit Trail in the fall. And that's where I did all, a lot of these drawings and paintings. And... We were there for maybe uh, kind of a long weekend, four or five days, and it was really, we were very isolated. There's nobody else in the campground. And one night, I'm gonna flip through these quick here, and these are just some image, other images of, of, and you can see I'm not thinking like, the whole Grand Vista thing. I'm just sitting at the campsite painting what I'm seeing, translating very sort of humble images like this into paintings. I also, I uh, did this location, this painting on location. Uh, the tree forms were directly painted uh, from in the campsite, and then the pool, I got really super bored with doing the dots, because I was kind of working my way down from the top, and um, so I decided to put a pool in there. There was a, a lake in the distance that I could hear, some water, um, and so that kind of generated the content. It's a good example of how I use both uh, uh, observation, but also just kind of my imagination. So uh, we were in the second night camping there. I got up to go outside, which sometimes I do, it was about 2 in the morning, and um, the moon was blasting through the trees. It was just an incredible light. I don't know, maybe it was one of those super moons or something, but um, I hadn't read about that on Facebook, so maybe it wasn't. It was just a regular moon, but it was incredible. It was bright, and I was standing there looking up at it, and it just seemed to dissolve the trees. The light just came passing through the trees, and again, this is kind of, the leaves are starting to come off the trees. Everything's kind of thinning out, and the light just blasted through, and I felt like I was literally kind of dissolving. And the next day I got up and did this drawing of that kind of memory. I was like, woke up with this, wow, that was intense. And so I did this drawing. Then I did this watercolor pretty much right on the spot to set up the paper and, and did the painting of the moon through the trees. And this painting is called Moon Dissolving Trees. And I realized while I was doing this that I had my subject for the painting I wanted to do for this lecture. So it had to do with trees and it had to do with the moon. 
So I came home to my studio and I worked this idea of the light of the moon, which is this really interesting kind of light, obviously. It's reflected light. The sun hits the moon and then kind of comes down. And so it has a very different quality to it. And um, I was intrigued by that idea, the metaphorical statement it makes, but also just kind of the formal possibilities. So I ran this through. This is, another, uh, this is a painting from Sakata State Park. Different sense of light in this one. Um, so I have a few ideas floating around my head right now. The moon, the trees, and water. And so here's some more moon and trees uh, paintings. These are ink on Yubo. And uh, the whole intent here is to try to figure out what I'm going to be trying to paint for, for what we're talking about here. This is a, a painting of the moon, uh, trees, and then a pool. So I start introducing the idea of the pool of water in with this. So I figured out my subject, the moon, the trees. Now I have to think about format. Um, and format, when we say format, it's pretty much like scale. What size of painting am I going to do? And since this is like a big deal, I'm going to do a big painting, right? <laughs> so um, I did a, decided to do a big painting. Uh, one canvas or multiples. I decided, um, well, I was debating this, whether I just want to make a gigantic one single painting. There's a certain aspect to the, a single canvas that I think is important. But there's an idea to multiples, too, that I think is important. Wilbur and I went to um, New York over Thanksgiving, and we saw a gallery at the Museum of Modern Art of Joan Mitchell's paintings, and I love her work. I just think it's incredible. And she frequently worked on multiple canvases. Um, and I think what's important about her work is that she doesn't sort of ignore the fact that it's multiple canvases. She's putting them together and then stopping the paint and sort of acknowledging the fact that she's using two or three canvases or more or four. So uh, that's an idea that's really important for me because I think uh, you, when you assert the multiple nature of the, like these multiple canvases, it's almost like um, a narrative. You create this rhythmic narrative between the canvases. That's an important idea. So I decided to do a triptych, three canvases. I start building the stretchers in my shop. Again, this is a nuts and bolts thing, right? So that's one of my stretchers I was working on. I have these gigantic tables. Here's the finished stretcher frames that I made. Stretching the canvas. Um, I just, you know, just uh, this is a heavyweight canvas that I just stretched like it's a drum on the frame. I put um, sizing on the canvas, two coats of sizing, which is a special material that shrinks the canvas slightly, then freezes it. Um, and I don't use rabbit skin glue anymore, just to let everybody know I use this other stuff. People used to like, ugh, rabbit skin glue, I use this uh, golden material, but it works great. And then I have to do three coats of gesso, so that's five individual coats of material on top of these, each of these canvases. So it's a lot of work. So now, where are we at? Let's make a painting. So I have a little video here, and I'm going to just play it and narrate it the best I can. Let's I'm going to make sure I hit the right button. Okay. Oh. oh, it's going. All right. Here I am. Uh, just, I just gessoed the canvas. <laughs> it's not on my computer running. So Bob Ross, spirit, <laughs> spirit guy, right? <laughs> so here I am blocking in the composition, thinking about the moon, the trees, leaves, dots. I'm looking at the watercolor um, that I made for this thing. On the right is my palette table with all the different brushes I use. Thinking just about lines. I mean, anytime you're make, uh, when you're standing here making a painting, you're thinking both about like what the painting is, but mostly about just kind of making marks. Oh, trigger warning! I'm uh, wearing my bathrobe. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, a lot of times I paint in the morning, and I had to stay true to you know. <laughs> I, I don't uh, get dressed. <laughs> Part of my process involves. Um, Painting something, then obliterating it. So you're going to see a lot of, you know, I'll make a mark and then throw a turpentine on top of it and let it sort of dissolve and, and like right there. I'm not happy with the moon at all. It's way too big. I'm not happy with my legs either. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see, like I said, I'm sort of treating each canvas as a separate thing. Okay, but, but not, too. I'm looking at the whole thing, so I'm kind of moving back and forth between treating the whole thing uh, and um, the individual thing. And these are uh, two mediums, neomegalip and galkid light, that I start adding to the paint at this stage. And it kind of alters the viscosity and the texture of the paint a little bit in real subtle ways that, I, that, I, that just adds character to the surface. If anything, making a painting is simply that. Uh, it's just making interesting marks in as many ways as you can. 
I'm very unhappy at this stage with the moon. It's not doing what I want it to do. There, I changed it a lot. I still don't like it, but I'm going to ignore it for a while. Part of the, uh, the thing I'm trying to do is uh, think of that whole idea of dissolving the moon. Um, I'm, I want the moon to kind of be this form, but not form. And I want it to kind of define the space around it, but not define it. <laughs> so here I'm just kind of going through doing accents. I'm still thinking about that middle space. Even though I'm working on the moon form, I'm really thinking about what's going on below, like in the water space. Um, that The whole time that just irritated me. I think I went to get a cup of coffee. I obviously didn't go to get dressed. <laughs> People always ask me, how do I actually you know, do the painting? How do I get up? And so you can see I'm using step stools, boards. I have a ladder. Uh, there's all kinds of ways just to get up and reach. And one of the hardest things about doing something this size is paying attention to your body's relationship to the thing. Because you can easily sort of get focused on one area and just move you know, like that. You have to think of the whole thing. So you can see the moons change quite a bit, um, and then I decide to start doing dots. I wanted to give it some sparkle. The dots, um, but the dots really irritate the heck out of me at this point, but I'm ignoring them. They're too big, and I decided to start putting some light into the water to kind of bring it out, because part of the sort of dynamic I wanted to create with this painting um, is this water behind the trees coming, reflecting the light of the moon, which is reflected light back to the viewer. I really didn't like that. <laughs> but every opportunity, whenever you make a mistake, it's, it's always an opportunity, you know? It's always a way to, so in this case, I um, threw some solvent on top of that and just let it run, and it really kind of changed that center space in an interesting way. I, I honestly, there's Tank. Um, <laughs> I honestly think every, every, the painting is mostly just sort of managing mess ups, you know, just kind of, and I think it's always been that way. One of the ways that they can tell, I was just reading this thing, one of the ways they can tell if a painting's a forgery or not is if there's no changes under the levels, if it's just like a painting. Um, there, I decided, I made a decision about, I put a spiral in. And spirals, of course, are symbols of, of, of change, of, of the path, of the journey. And it seemed, um, like an appropriate symbol to insert there in the reflected water. And, the, and it also functions as kind of a, a ripple, like water, like you threw a stone into the water. So it's kind of these multiple levels of interpretation. More dots, more dots. And of course, this painting is down in the student union. There's me in the letter. That actually was about like two hours long, <laughs> that little shot I said on the letter. I start introducing these squares of color, blue, to just kind of bring the, the kind of emphasize the picture plane, the, the front of the painting, the foreground, and to create a little bit of tension. I hated these blue dots. So I wiped them out. <laughs> That's the painting. Thank you. Thanks. That's nice, yeah? And of course, this can be seen down in the, um, we're going to have a reception after the lecture here, and they have this painting in the gallery down there, so you can check it out and see if it kind of compares. I called The Moon Within. It went through a whole bunch of different titles, and of course it made sense, The Moon Within. It's that moon within me, so, and you, I hope. So here's just a little bit of just... The leftovers, so here's one of my palette tables. Like I said, I had about three of those that I worked on, worked with. A lot of people think they make a painting. Whenever an artist makes a painting, they just like, use one single brush. Well, this is the brushes I used extensively in making of this thing. So it's like everything from these big fat things to little tiny brushes. So what are magical landscapes about? 
What's the point? Um, I started this talk by suggesting that landscape painting, and I reinforced the idea with the modern examples, that these carry ideas. So I have to, some, I have to be honest and try to figure what the idea I'm trying to you know, get across to these things. So it's important to ask what that idea is. And I'm going to start with one of my favorite quotes ever. Uh, this is from Annie Dillard's great book, Pilgrim at Tinker's Creek. The gaps are the thing. The gaps are the spirit's one home, the altitudes and latitudes so dazzlingly spare and clean that the spirit can discover itself once like a once blind man unbound. The gaps are the clefts in the rock where you cower to see the back parts of God. They are the fissures between the mountains and cells. The wind lances through, the icy narrowing fjords splitting the cliffs of mystery. Go up into the gaps if you can find them. They shift and vanish too. Stalk the gaps. Squeak into a gap in the soil. Turn and unlock more than a maple universe. Now I'm going to read a poem from Rick Robbins. Rick and I are good friends. We collaborate on a lot, a lot of different things. And I find his poetry incredibly inspiring, as well as other kinds of poetry, um, other, or other poetry by other poets. But, um, he and I uh, have collaborated on a few different projects, and now I'm going to read a poem of his called Memory of Water, Constellation, Night Water. Uh, it's based on a painting I did in 2014. We found ourselves turned around after the storm, entering harbors we knew only from maps of the other world. These stars could not help. We recognized this trough from a desert all of us had crossed, a set of mountains we'd all climbed. All that was lifetimes ago. We survived on small fish the boy would pull up, mackerel or sardines, scarred fish but whole. Rain filled the pails daily with a new story. Clouds, finally, after the clearing clouds saved us in their way. Small rare bodies just overhead between us and a blue routine. They yielded. They yielded until nothing remained and they were everywhere. The next darkness came on, dragging its infinite alphabet of light. Someone began to sing. By Rick. So Rick and I um, took a bunch of, well, let me back up here. Um, art creates relationships, connections between us and the world we live in. Here's an example from Machu Picchu. Rick and I took um, students there this past summer, um, and the altars and stones and the places they have there, in a sense, are kind of like almost, they couldn't paint, obviously. They didn't have paint or anything, but they used stones to make this connection between the way they felt, the way they thought about the world they lived in, and that world. So what's amazing about Machu Picchu is these relationships. I was far more interested about how the mountains that surrounded the space and then how they um, articulated those mountains, as you can see in this photo, with the stones and the altars they created. Here's our group, and you can see how it kind of parallels. And so I'd suggest that there's kind of this almost intimacy between these distant mountains. They're trying to create this connection. They're trying to explore those gaps that um, Annie Dillard uh, explored in her writing. This is another poem called Machu Picchu. We are climbing its thousand steps across its terraces, young and old, hardy and faint. Jaguars will find us tonight in the dream, whisper our new names, what's this we'll wonder in the morning, orchids sprung from our lips, heart left beating after the condor passes. One more quote from the uh, writer Susie Gablick. This is from her prescient book, Has Modernism Failed? She challenged some sacred notions proposed by modernism. One of those is the myth of individuality. Um, and I got to see her speak. I'd left New York um, in, uh, uh, when was that? We left in 1984. And I saw her speak at the Madison Art Center. And I was really kind of despondent about leaving New York, kind of giving up my, art, my quote, art career. And um, she gave me a lot of hope in her talk. And here's a quote from her. Sometimes people think when I talk this way that I have a grudge against art objects, but it isn't true. Or they think, given the problems of the world, I'm suggesting that artists must try to do something about them. But the truth, the truth is, I don't think that either art or artists are what will save the world. Only a new way of being can do that. One that knits people together through an inspired ethos of generosity and caring. And I return to the root idea of what it means to be value-centered to make value-centered moral choices. Without this, there is no way forward from here. The fundamental problem in the West today is the illusion of autonomy. It fails to recognize the interconnectedness of everyone and everything, and it ignores the well-being of the whole. She continues, 
Art is an instrument and can be used to make a difference to our relationship with nature. It is, it is good for some, and this, in large part, should be the true measure of its success, not money, not favorable reviews and an impressive list of shows. I've come to believe that true success manifests through a certain quality of awareness and an ability to lie in an interconnected way with compassion and responsibility. This means being able to step away from acquisitive and exploitive forms of individualism and from the egocentricism of the present social order. And again, that's from, uh, actually that's her uh, new introduction in the 2004 uh, edition of the 1984 original. My goal as an instructor and an artist has always been to question the idea the myth, really, of the individual creative genius. Maybe it is an attempt to question the nature of not just individuality, but the notion of originality, that art making is an attempt to assert one's unique voice into the culture. I think it is more of a way to acknowledge and foster all of our unique voices. It isn't a hierarchy or a competition. It's a pool, a field ready for planting. It's the woods at night. It's that random beam of light on a leaf. It's beauty. It's poetry. The great lesson I've learned from my partner Wilbur is that everyone has gifts and talents. It's such a cliche, but it's true. Part of finding joy in life is figuring out how to use the gift of our unique life. Art making is special, yet it is not a statement or testimonial of our individuality. Rather, it is about how much we are the same. A work of art connects people. A work of art cannot exist without people. It is an affirmation of our shared humanity. It asserts our collective imagination. It is an acknowledgment of the power and uniqueness of creativity. It's about being human. So here's my pain. I think art is about transformation. A person takes a thing and turns it into another thing. It's that simple. Then that thing gets looked at by other people. Those people say stuff about it. They love it, they hate it, and so forth. What is important is not the thing. The thing that we think of as the art object is only a catalyst for continued dialogue, conversations, thoughts, words, the stuff we do. The art object starts something, that's it. The object is temporary. We just fantasize that it lasts forever and fleeting, really kind of uh, pointless. It's the relationships and the ideas that the thing brings forth into the worlds of our imaginations, the world of the imaginal. That's the important thing. I'm telling a story with this painting. It's a story of change. The moon shone into my face, and I was transfixed and transformed. I wanted, no, I was compelled to tell that story, to bring that story to you, to share it with the hope that it will have some sort of impact on your thinking, maybe even on your life, that it might connect with a memory of an experience you have had. It becomes an object of a shared thought between us. I think that is frankly beautiful, poetic, and profound, and what art is all about. Thank you so very much. Well, that's very kind of you all. Thank you. I have additional thanks go to Arlen Bloomer. Smoke and Bradley Coulter, <laughs> Gwen Westerman, my studio assistant, Abby Delecki, the Centennial Student Union for letting me have a show down there, and my Facebook community. I workshop this on Facebook like crazy, so I thank you all for that. Hi there. <laughs> uh, questions? Yes. Hey, Don. So, most of the stuff I've seen in Europe, maybe it's all of it, we are going to Mm hmm. Why watercolor rather than some other medium? Why is this an artist who is this or that? Well, every medium has a different quality, and it's up to the artist to kind of explore that quality. And I, I, I do do a lot of oil paintings and a lot of acrylic paintings. Now I just started using So, it's just kind of what kind of gets you interested. One of the things about watercolor is it's very portable. So when I travel, since I started traveling, actually when I did my sabbatical, my very first sabbatical year years ago, I was all over Europe and stuff, I took some ink with me and so I started doing, I did all these ink drawings and that kind of led to doing watercolors while I travel. So uh, in fact, the, the trip that um, 
Rick and I took the students on was all about that, learning to use the creative process, in his case, poetry. In my case, I was teaching him how to do watercolors to sort of experience new places. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a, a very portable, portable medium. medium. It's also a very delicate medium. It taught me a lot about how to make marks in a, in a lyrical way. Versus, so I learned a lot from the medium as well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sure, thank you. Yes, hi. With the painting? Oh, I had to get it done for this thing, for one. <laughs> I had a deadline. Yeah, I, I, it's, always a, it's always a weird question. They sort of have a, a self-declarative quality. I mean, how do you know when your kid's grown up? When they got a, you know, they have kids. And, I don't know. <laughs> it, it just, it's a, finishing a painting almost is, is an evolution that starts when you start the painting, you know? So it's a, it's a weird feeling, yeah. But, it, but it's not like, you don't judge it against something. So it's not like if you're painting an apple, it looks just like the apple. That's not, you know, even somebody who wants to paint the apple, they have to make other kinds of choices about when it's done, when it's have it really done, so that makes sense. Oh, I just attacked the thing, yeah. Although it looks a little crazier because of the but. <laughs> yes, Kathy, hi. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I don't journal. Uh, I do a lot of drawings and, and stuff, um, but I do read quite a bit, as much as I can. And um, yeah, I, and I find I brought in poetry because I, I, I didn't answer the question. You know, I didn't really, I, I didn't, I, originally I said um, I was going to, when I talked to the committee about this presentation, I was going to demystify the art process, but I think I just brought more mystery into it. So, um, <laughs> you know, and that was the poetry and stuff. So, yeah. Yes, Kay. Oh, Barbara, Barbara, I'm sorry. I was thinking, Kathy. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think, um, gosh, I think it's just, you get, I, I get curious about like a new material. So like a lot of the, the pieces that I showed you, and, and again, this has worked just not even the last year, really. It's, it's fairly recent work. Um, I get really curious about the, that Yupo. I found this plastic paper that, um, that, I, that I did those the bright kind of intense pieces on. Those were, so I just got curious about that surface. What kind of marks can I make on that surface? Um, so I just kind of explore it. So it's that, that kind of fundamental. Sometimes it's a single brush. I get interested in like how a brush works. Um, and so that'll sort of inspire a whole new um, direction. So, yeah, I don't know. I get impatient too, I'll just be, and, and you know, one of my professors years ago, he, he, he was a diehard modernist. And he just said, You're, you gotta focus. You know, because he'd come into my studio and I'd have like 100 things going on at once, literally, just like I was crazy. Rod Carswell, he would always be like, you know, you just gotta do one thing. And that was kind of the modernist thing, you know, like just do one thing and kill it to death. And, you know, or, that's redundant, um, kill it. <laughs> beat it to death, beat it to death. Um, so I just never did that. You know, I just was never, I'm more of a, I guess, a postmodernist where I love to shift and change and, and try different things constantly, not settle down. Oh, yeah, 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 I do. I mean, these, this new one kind of harkens back to some work I was doing years ago. I mean, it changes and moves around, but yeah. You kind of only do one thing your whole life, really. Just there's variations on it. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Sean, what's up? Good. <laughs> Glad I'm done with this. <laughs> You can come on down and see it. Yeah. <laughs> mm hmm 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the Facebook thing is, I know people think Facebook's like dumb and stuff. Um, and it kind of is, it really is. But for me, it's like, there was an old trick that painters had a long time ago. And no, it's not an old trick. You can still do the trick if you want. And that's to look at your painting in a mirror. Like you look, you hold up a mirror and you look at it. And what that does is it like you see it kind of, you see it reversed. And what that does is you see it with new eyes. Uh, and it's a great way to sort of analyze what you're doing, just kind of look at it and you think about it. Facebook's kind of the same way. I put something up there and I'm looking at it and people are commenting and commenting on it. And I love that. I, I, you know, it doesn't bother me that somebody will say, oh, you should do this. And I'll go, yeah, they're right. I should do that. And I'll do it. So, you know, or I'll just ignore what they said. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's cool. I'm glad it, I, it, it kind of resonated with you in some way, so thank you. Yeah, yeah. no, uh, Sean's referring to the fact that I posted like every second uh, on Facebook, yeah, Sharon's nodding, um, about making this painting on Facebook. I just kind of, I had a, I don't know if it was a group or something, but um, I really, you know, had it just, I made comments, a lot of the stuff I used in here was on Facebook, and people reacted to it, and it was a really great way to kind of engage people, just to How long does it take? That one only took like three weeks. Can you believe that? But I was rushing around, and I have to shout out to Connie. I don't think she's here because I wasn't in the office at all. <laughs> so, yes. Um, I think, the, the, again, the moon form. You know, I just kind of kept hammering away at that a lot. Yeah, to get it just right because I didn't want it just to be... You know, I could just make a circle and call it the moon, right? But I didn't want it to be that. I wanted it to be a little bit more complex and just richer of a, of a thing and say more about the experience of the moon than just the, a symbol of the moon. So it's got like several circles and several layers to it and it's different sizes all in kind of one thing. And I think, you know, it's, it's an interesting question because um, I think the way I finished the painting was, to, and you'll see it down in the gallery, I just went into the moon and just sort of went boop, 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 with little bits of white and just sort of solidified this little tiny orb and that kind of brought the whole thing together for me. So um, yeah, there was a moment where it was finished for sure. Yes? <laughs> yes. Um, I think there's just, I, I mean, I. I I don't know. It's a good question. There's a ri I guess there's a rhythm. To well, first of all, I'm thinking, like in the case of this particular painting, I'm thinking of um, sticks, you know, out in the woods and branches and things. So I'm kind of connecting that rhythmic quality to them. Um, but then they also have, you know, any painting has to somehow fit, kind of physically connect the viewer to its making. So when you, like, look at my painting, I hope you almost kind of feel yourself making it or you kind of make this mo. You know what I'm saying? There's, like, kind of a physical connection there. So I think one of the things I do, and actually it's another really good question, um, I ch tend to change the pace of my marks a lot. So, like, you notice with those trees, I was trying to actually, like, create trees with single marks with these big brushes. So not just dab, 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 but it was just like, <laughs> there's a tree. So that's how trees feel. They're massive and they're, you know, solid like pillars. Uh, and then I like to contrast those sort of massive marks uh, with little tiny dots that say a whole different thing, because you can almost imagine me going like that, thinking, oh, man, because somebody will say, well, I can't believe you made all those dots. So that's this kind of interesting connection. So I don't know if I answered your question totally, but I like to change it up to kind of create a different relationship. Sure. Yes? Uh, you got to holler. Yeah? Ooh. Yeah? No, there's no people in that painting. No animals were, I'd have to file an IRB thing. Um, <laughs> no animals or people were injured in the creation of this painting, only brushes <laughs> and my bathrobe. <laughs> um, yes? That, that isn't my dog, that's Anna's dog, and I was, Hank, huh? 
Got my my grand dog. Yeah, he, I was babysitting him or dog sitting him or something like that. So he got in the got in the video. But Hank, yeah, yeah, yes. Uh, the hardest thing to do. Watercolor is different because it's not, it's transparent, so you see through it. It's not an opaque process. Uh, like that big oil paint is opaque, so I can cover things up. So with watercolor, you have to be very intentional and concentrate on that. Um, you have to understand it's a different relationship between making mistakes, like, uh, like thinking and making mistakes. So you have to be careful with it because it's transparent. That makes sense? I don't know. Yeah. Yes, Sharon. Mm -hmm. they, they give the painting a soul you know I mean it's like people you have a lot of experiences and you have you know you gotta kind of have little babies are beautiful but they don't have much character really they all kind of look the same and um, so they're cute they're cute <laughs> They're all cute, but uh, but a person, you know, it's like you get older and you have experiences and you have character and soul, you know. So yeah, that's so for the painting, it's like those initial stages create that soul, you know. And then I'm also the other thing that's really important to understand is, even though I had a very fixed idea about what I wanted to do with this piece, um, I was still wandering around a lot trying to figure it out in those initial stages. But again, it's like it's a it's a path. Just play one on TV. <laughs> no, no, there's no stupid question. <laughs> I know. It. Go ahead. You know, that's, I, I think, um, uh, I th you're kind of talking about this whole notion of skill, like, like learning how to draw things the way they look or learning how to draw like a photograph and all that kind of stuff. My first lesson to my students in my beginning painting class or even a beginning drawing class is we are not machines. And I know you like to make machines, but, but you make them. You're not a machine. You're a human. And so our drawings and the art we make really have to, has to um, it's about our hands and our minds and our hearts and all that other stuff uh, coming out. So, so there are artists that can draw things to look perfectly like photographs, um, but they generally use photographs to accomplish that. So it's still a handmade thing. So we're just not machines. Um, and I don't know why we always try to be machines. It's weird. That's, I don't know if I answered your question only on the other. Oh, I can take one more. Yes. The big painting, or? Uh, uh, the moon part. I really like how I resolved that part, because the whole part was to sort of, again, kind of create this balance between solidity and, and the ephemeral sort of feel. But I mean, if you think about the experience I had looking at the moon, there's light but no light, and it's a kind of a psychological thing, so there's all these layers to it. It's not just about painting the moon. So I feel like I kind of captured that with all the little dots and the different, I mean, you got to see it downstairs, but. Um, yeah, I'm pretty happy with it. It's it's okay. <laughs> we don't have a wall. We, you all know I live out in the poor farm. We have all these huge walls. Maybe some of you don't know it, but we have a big house, big house with big walls. We don't have a wall for this thing, so <laughs> I don't know where I'm going to put it. <laughs> anyway, thank you. So thank you, Brian, so much. Um, thank you for inspiring us. Um, thank you for increasing our understanding of your work. And, and I think most importantly, thank you for offering us some insight into um, a, a window, if you will, into the creative process. And, and I fully enjoyed this uh, and, and really appreciate it the effort you've put into to sharing with us tonight. I thought it was interesting, the 
The second to the last question was a little bit of a dialogue between an engineer and an artist <laughs> and a past recipient, last year's recipient of the award. So I, I thought that again was what we're trying to cultivate is that kind of interaction and tension between different perspectives and points of view. So I, I thought that was wonderful. So. Um, each year, uh, the selection committee reviews many excellent proposals and hears presentations before selecting the recipient for the next year. Um, tonight, um, I'm happy to announce that the awardee for the 2020 Douglas R. Moore Faculty Research Lectureship is present. I will ask um, Dr. Sean Wee Wu to please stand up and be acknowledged. Thank you very much, congratulations. Dr. Wu's presentation next year will explore developments related to high capacity antennas and 5G systems. This research will interest anyone who has a cell phone and um, anyone who's interested in the impact of 5G systems on the future. So um, thank you again for submitting your application. And I wanted to thank everyone, both those that are present and may have applied for the award, as well as those that may not be with us. Um, congratulations to every faculty member who submitted a proposal. As I indicated, we, um, we exceeded all our, our expectations and had a record number of applications. And because the pool is so rich in quality, it's, it's unfortunate we only have a single award each year that we can confer on our faculty members. So um, at this point, um, we're ending the formal part of the, the, um, the event, but I want to encourage all of you to join Professor Frank uh, in the lower level of the CSU, where the gallery there in the Hearth Lounge area has uh, uh, been hung with a number of his works and we can continue the conversation and there are refreshments down there. So please continue the conversation, join us and thank you very much for being here this evening. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I dropped my envelope too. <laughs>